Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Euh, J'ai l'honneur de me joindre everyone. It is my honor to join you today to uh, talk about key issues that will shape not only our future but also uh, the future of uh, future generations. We are all faced to the increasing uh, challenge of uh, climate change. It's never been so important to uh, examine how Canada can achieve net zero uh, while uh, increasing innovation and promoting competitiveness. As uh, Mr. Sabia so uh, well explained, I am a member of uh, ENZAB, since it was created in 2021, its mandate is to provide independent advice to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. that we believe are essential to developing the most likely pathways for Canada to achieve net zero by 2050. One of our foundational values is to seize the upsides, and there's a lot of them, recognizing the ma major economic, environmental, health, and social benefits that are directly linked to climate action and the real and rising cost of inaction. The ENSAB recognizes the most likely pathways to net zero are those that have the broadest benefits for individual, families, workers, businesses, and society as a whole. Today, I have the great privilege of introducing someone who is at the forefront of the mission to build Canada's pathway to net zero. The Honorable Stephen Gilbo, Minister of Environment and Climate Change of Canada. Le ministre Gilbo a été un défenseur infatigable. Gilbo was a, uh, an advocate in the fight against the climate crisis and he developed a clear vision of uh, how environmental responsibility can go hand in hand with economic growth. Last year, he asked ENSA to uh, give him advice on how to uh, help Canada reach its, uh, net, its uh, 2030 and 2035 targets. Those are crucial steps to make sure that Canada is on the right track to uh, net zero by 2050. A few weeks ago, we published two reports responding to these requests. They are public, and I invite you all to read them on the website, on our website. The ENSAB has advised the federal government to redouble its efforts and implement new measures to reach its 2030 climate target and adopt an ambitious 2035 target and tools comparable to our trading partners many of whom are represented here today. One of these tools is a national carbon budget, which you will learn more about in a, pa in a later panel. En élaborant son avis, le GCPC a pris en compte les multiples took into account the many benefits of climate action in terms of the environment, health, and the economy. The efforts that we shall deploy to mitigate the effects of climate change pour assurer la réussite du Canada sur la voie de la carbonatrice y compris la réalisation de Canada achieve net zero including uh, benefits such as job creation in the growing sector of renewables and making electricity more affordable and uh, health improvements uh, because of cleaner energy will not be able to achieve Canada's climate change targets all of Canadian society has a role to play provinces Territories, municipalities, indigenous governing bodies, indigenous knowledge holders, scientists, the private sector, and civil society all have an important role in reaching our decarbonization goals. Le chemin du Canada vers la carboneutralité consiste à réaménager. To net zero in Canada consists in uh, reimagining our economy so it is more resilient, more competitive, and uh, forward looking. By adopting climate measures, we are uh, paving the way to new technologies, more efficient production methods, and uh, labor that's uh, forward looking. Is becoming a key factor in our national competitiveness. Minister Gilbo's leadership has been instrumental in promoting policies that mitigate climate change 
and also create opportunities for businesses to thrive in a green economy. Please join me in a, giving a warm welcome to Mr. as he shares his vision for a net zero competitive and prosperous future for Canada. Thank you. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Wallalin, Wallywan. Thank you very much for your attention. Bonjour, hello everyone. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you, uh, Gaetan, for this great scene-setting introduction. I would first like to recognize the fact that we are in the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people, and I'm grateful to the caretakers of this land and water, and I ask you to join me in honoring the connection that the Anishinaabe people have to this land for millennia. I, before I start, I would like to pick up on something Michael said just a few minutes ago. I know we have uh, guests from, uh, from the United States here. Uh, our hearts really go out to everyone in Florida with what they're facing right now. This conference comes at a pivotal time. Building a cleaner and stronger economy in Canada is the course we're on. It is why we're all gathered here. We share a collective understanding and appreciation for both the economic opportunities and the environmental necessity in front of us. Now, I see many familiar faces around the audience. I know that many of you have likely come from out of town, and I would like to assure you that Ottawa isn't just a place filled with hot air. The political sound bites and artificial posturing we see in the media, there's more than that. Behind the political polarization that the conservatives drive, there are still some serious minds at work, thoughtful and hardworking people constructively working to attract and steer investment. Construire une économie propre, tout comme ce qui est transformationnel. Building a clean economy requires a vision and bold action. In each sector, we can see examples of such leadership, those who uh, make this vision their own. We've just heard about uh, amazing examples during the previous panel. Two and a half years ago, our government launched our climate plan, the most comprehensive plan in Canada's history. We did our homework, building on the work of our predecessors, to give Canada a truly credible path towards carbon neutrality. Sector by sector, we showed how we could do it, how we could really do it together. And since then, with the help of everyone in this room, we've put this plan in motion. Combined industry leadership with careful but ambitious balance of investments and regulatory tools, we are bending the curve on Canada's emissions. Before 2015, when this government came into power, Canada was widely considered a laggard. Today, we are punching above our weight. And I can tell you this is something I hear all the time. But more importantly, our plan is working. Evidence of progress is rolling in. Recently, the Canadian Climate Institute showed our country's net emissions are starting to drop between 2022 and 2023. The Institute also found that Canada's economy grew while emissions dropped, what we call decoupling. What does it mean? It means growing the economy in 2024 does not mean more pollution. In fact, it points to the larger transformation on the way. Now, Canadians may best be associate our climate plan with carbon pricing. Who could blame them? But there are, in fact, over 100 measures we've put in place as part of this plan that serve as the foundation of a cleaner economy for our country. Those measures have taken us from a place where, in 2015, we projected to blow away past our 2030 emissions target, to where we are now, set to surpass the modest targets of the Harper government, to meet our 2026 interim goals, and on track towards 2030. Our emissions are now at their lowest point in 25 years in this country. We now have seen a drop in emission while our economy is chugging at full stream. This progress should not be taken for granted. It requires constant discipline, constant foresight, and a constant readiness to defend this infrastructure from those who seek to tear it down. We need to keep our horse in the race of a global economy that is moving faster than ever. And I'm pleased to share some exciting news on how we're trying to move the dial even further on developing a clean economy in Canada. First, yesterday, the Deputy Prime Minister announced the guidelines for a Made in Canada Sustainable Investment Taxonomy, 
and mandatory climate disclosures for largest Canadian private businesses. The Sustainable Investment Taxonomy gives investors certainty on whether their investment are consistent with meeting global climate targets. It provides needed clarity that will boost financing from the private sector for sustainable activities across our economy. That includes things like building EV batteries, generating clean electricity, and decarbonization projects in heavy industry. The taxonomy will help direct investment to much needed job creating activities. Many of you will have seen the headlines on this. Simply put, projects need to be credibly aligned with limiting temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius to be considered green or transition investment. Of course, developing these guidelines do not prevent investors from deciding where they wish to put their money. They are purely voluntary, but they do provide a common language on whether investments support climate goals or not. Similarly, requiring large businesses to provide climate-related financial disclosure to shareholders will help attract investment in sustainable activities across the country. Disclosures help investors better understand how large businesses are thinking about and managing risk related to climate change. As we look to fleshing out the regulatory approach, we will be engaging many of you in this process. Enfin, nous capitalisons sur le succès de notre programme d'obligation verte. We are leveraging our green bond program. Like the taxonomy, it will direct investment to essential uh, uh, investments and in essential projects. We have issued green bonds uh, twice in 2022 and this year. Every time, final orders way exceeded uh, the initial offering. Because of this strong demand, we've opened a third uh, wave of green bonds, and I'm happy to report that demand is still significant and that we've still uh, quite exceeded uh, the offer. Uh, sustainable financing is the way of the future. Last year, our government delivered on the clean fuel regulations, which encourages oil and gas refineries to lower the carbon intensity of their fuel production. It's a smart policy. Once backed by all political parties, now demonized by an opposition leader hell-bent on giving big polluters a break. Because of built-in incentives with this policy, we've already seen significant investments. Over $53 billion have been announced across Canada in low-carbon fuels such as green hydrogen, renewable diesel, and sustainable aviation fuel. For example, the oil refinery in Combine Chance, Newfoundland, was converted into a major renewable diesel facility. Federal government supported Braya Renewable Fuels to commercialize its production of re renewable diesels and sustainable aviation fuel. It started operations in February of this year and now produces up to 18,000 barrels a day of renewable diesel. 200 people work there full time. These, are, these and similar companies now have the ability to create and sell valuable credits for supplying low carbon fuels in, in Canada. That's progress. And it comes from creating the right support and incentive structures to the industry. I was delighted by some of the previous speaker, including Adam Auer, the president of and CEO of the Cement Association of Canada. It has taken determination to turn words into action and guide the change we've witnessed in the cement industry in the past few years. It takes a lot of heat and energy to make cement using conventional, conventional processes. As you heard, the, the Cement Association of Canada decided that they had to change. This industry released their roadmap to cleaner sources of fuel, and they stuck to their plan. I saw some of those results this summer when I visited a green cement plant in St. Mary's, Ontario. This is where carbon pricing, and in this case, the industrial carbon pricing, really gets a, ch a chance to shine. With money collected by the federal government from carbon pricing system on industry, we reinvested those revenues into emissions reduction projects like the ones in St. Mary's. New kiln technology was installed that uses low carbon fuels. This process reduces the use of high price carbon intensive fuels by 30%. This means less climate pollution and cleaner air for the town. It also increases the company's long-term competitiveness and sustainability and pride. Take a town like St. Mary's, a population of under 9,000 people this major employer has made a significant low-carbon change in its production. From that, we get 
direct positive results, such as the sustainability of jobs at the cement plant, the drop in greenhouse gas pollution equivalent to 9,400 powered cars off the road every year. Third, they're saving energy cost for their business. Examples like this play out in countless communities across the country. What's terrible is that where there should be a consensus on carbon pricing on heavy industry, we have an opposition leader who, again, is changing tact. He's ready to rip up one of the best tools for a political ideology that doubts the science of climate change. And unfortunately, that affects investments' decisions. Le gouvernement fédéral a un rôle important à jouer pour mobiliser les investissements nécessaires. The federal government has an important role to play to mobilize investment in implementing its projects. How can Canada maintain its momentum? Let's look at the renewable uh, sector. Internationally, this sector has taken off a long time ago. Europe represents three quarters, uh, meets three quarters of its demand through renewable energy. That's remarkable. Clean energy sources are reliable, less costly, and uh, energy produced is uh, cheaper to store. Renewable energy businesses uh, are growing at a spectacular pace. In New Brunswick, there's uh, the largest uh, battery storage facility. It is supervised by the Tobique First Nation and close to uh, the city of St. John. When I visited the site, the chief of the First Nation, Ross Bernie, said that one of our traditional values as a nation is to take care of the environment. And green energy projects like this one uh, will start to dominate the future. Steve Birdie is right. Joue un rôle majeur dans la révolution de l'énergie renouvelable que nous observons d'un océan à l'autre à l'autre. Canada is already in a good position with the vast majority of our electricity from non-emitting sources. We know that demand will likely double for electricity in the coming decades. It's no longer a matter of doing the right thing for the environment, but also the right thing for the economy. Across countries, Companies are shifting investment towards cleaner industry to meet our future energy demands. That's why we launched new investment tax credit for clean electricity production, which add to a range of programs supporting new clean electricity development in this country. Labor groups have endorsed these credits because for employers to receive the full value, they must commit to fair payment of good paying union jobs. And we will launch the clean electricity regulations to back our strategy for a net zero grid in Canada. There are so many opportunities awaiting nationwide. Canadians can once again expect to hear a lot of hot air on this issue, unfortunately. But we, in this room, can appreciate the opportunities that come with building a cleaner economy. You're in, a position, you're in this room because you have seen business pivot, or you've guided a business to respond to events to adjust, to morph, to reinvent itself. Changing the way we power our daily lives, our Canadian society, really starts with changing the way we think. The federal government is here to guide growth, to support the science, and to spark investment. L'économie propre et robuste du Canada nous permettra de mener des vies prospères. Clean and robust clean energy in Canada will allow us to prosper. The climate crisis means that we must innovate and communicate and collaborate together. Thank you for your time, your attention, and for the perspective you will bring back home uh, from this conference. Amazing. Uh, a very special thank you to the Honorable Stephen Guibault, Minister of Environment and Climate Change Canada, for being here today. Um, just to reflect on, on some of the things that were shared this morning, uh, and I, I promise I won't keep you too long from your, your lunch, um, I think the, the sequence of speakers is, is pretty interesting. We had uh, Michael Sabia from Hydro-Quebec, um, and then Minister Guibault, and then, you know, an Indigenous person coming up here. And I think it's interesting because, you know, in what we know as Canada, one of the, the uh, maybe best kept secrets, <laughs> and I'm, uh, adding to, 
to the to the wonderful work that I think partnership creates um, is the fact that outside of government and outside of utility, indigenous people, indigenous communities are leading in renewable energy projects across this country. We are the second largest asset owner of renewable energy projects in this country. And I think that is something to, um, to really honor and respect and look at you know, how this all came to be. And I think when you, you, know, you reflect on some of the words from, from Michael Sabia on, on the necessity of partnership and the words of Minister Guibault on you know, the advancement and innovation that we need to look for, I think um, there are some key pieces there in terms of what does kinship and prosperity, what does that mean to all of us? So again, Thank you so much to Minister Guibault. Um, it's, been, it's been an interesting journey, and I know um, it's not an easy one to, to courageously do, do the work um, in a political climate at, as there is today. Um, so everybody here, don't go too far. Um, we will be, uh, oh, we'll be having lunch. And then don't go too far, because we have another keynote speaker and then we have a very interesting panel of Indigenous leaders that will be coming up. So I hope you take some time to reflect on this morning's discussion and grab some good food and network a little bit. So thank you so much.